there's something humorous about a person who lived through this era, because while I immigrated, I immigrated in 1946, so I've been in Vancouver most of my life, is something humorous about having Michael have to go and dig up stuff that I lived through, and now I'm going to talk about stuff he lived through. So <laughs> it, it's a bit of a, a two-way. I also, just while we're setting this up, was recently doing an article for a referee journal. You don't do this very often when you're in academics. You do it in academics, you don't do it in the practical world. And the person sent back, you know, source, 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 source in all the comments. And I kind of went, oh, sort of been there, done that, what other source? And I think that's what a lot of people in this audience today, hands up everybody who either worked for or, like Mike, was a um, politician in the city of Vancouver. Rhonda, come on, put your hand up. Nathan, you worked for the city of Vancouver. Jeanette, where's your hand? <laughs> Lots of people who are part of this story lived it, worked it, and created what is Vancouver today. I, like Michael, and we didn't co collaborate on this, think that Vancouverism actually started before the 1970s. And I'm going to focus primarily on the 1970s through to sort of 2006. Everything past there is too recent history because that's when I left the city. If you look, however, before Vancouverism, before team came into office, we were really dealing with a city plan which was typical of most US cities. It was a plan by Bartholomew of putting roads to jobs downtown so people could commute from the suburbs. It was a city and a plan that had industry around the downtown. But it was different from many other cities in North America because we actually had experience, as Michael's just said, with significant housing adjacent to the downtown, even from the early years. I'm sorry, I didn't have to go to the library. I actually had this picture. Uh, the downtown being adjacent, and my mentor in the 1960s, Walter Hardwick, said, Anne, why don't you write your master's thesis in geography on residents surrounding the downtown? And so those eras where Michael showed so many different buildings going up in the downtown was actually the subject of my master's thesis. Now, at the same time, just as an aside, I spent a lot of time in the 60s standing on the corner of Maine and Hastings. Now, you might wonder about that. It was quite a different neighborhood at that time, but the law courts were there, and my ex-husband was a lawyer, so I spent time standing there. But one of the first jobs when I joined the city that Mike Harcourt gave me was a challenge to go and get some federal funding to make the downtown east side a neighborhood improvement area. And I sort of thought, how on earth do I make this point? Central, as it was then, Canada Mortgage and Housing didn't think what we should be doing was funding some of these skid row communities. Well, you know something? We just needed one piece of statistics. From 1971, Dunbar was the most stable in terms of length of residence of neighborhood in the Vancouver city, and the downtown east side was second. It was the neighborhood people had lived mostly when they'd come out, as Nathan mentioned, from the resource industries and located there. Once we could tell the national government that this was a stable neighborhood, we got funding. And we all know that freeways turned the directions of Vancouver, which is where a few comments on what has been called elsewhere in the world. And I now understand Vancouver because I've been working everywhere else in the world. They talking about making a sustainable downtown. You had a little more hair then, Michael, a little more hair. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but when I talk elsewhere about creating a sustainable inner city, it's usually about the four big decisions that the council of the day made. 
I think the first big decision we all realize we had lots of experience building housing next to the downtown. Well, here we have Coal Harbor and False Creek where we can continue that kind of inner city housing. Building freeways, no. Housing near jobs, yes. Meaning we were planning through accessibility long before this became a thing to do in new urbanism. And if you look even at the results of that later and see that while the population of the downtown has gone up significantly, while the number of jobs has increased in recent years, the numbers of vehicles entering the downtown has decreased. And I think a lot of that goes back to those early years. Those early years when, as Michael started to mention, the iconic Vancouver design of a podium with the density coming out of the tower, with, I think, a creative feature other people notice of us is that while we had a very strong vision of what we wanted in the downtown, there was some musts and some mays in how we did the actual regulations. And the musts were things like public access to the waterfront. I remember Rick Hulbert telling me how when he did his first designs for Li Kai Sheng, Li Kai Sheng said, nope, we're going to put these buildings right on the waterfront. And Rick Hulbert says, don't think so. Think council will say no to that. But, well, there were some musts. I think one of the other creative things we did was often to give guidelines and then let the creativity of the developer, the architect, come forward. So we did some guidelines about how to house people, families particularly, at high density, but said to the architect, you show us how you're going to make these principles work in the environment. Meaning we had, in retrospect, we learned a lot by phasing developments. The first phase in South Falls Creek, moving to the North Shore of Falls Creek, we learned that on the South Shore, we could design family housing at quite high densities, and then took that and built on it to the, for the North Shore. In fact, just last week, I saw a newspaper headline, Downtown Vancouver seeks more houses to meet demand for family, uh, sort of more schools for children. A really incredible difference to the downtown of many cities. And as time passed, remember Bill, in your Clouds of Change, 1990, the idea of a sustainable community. Then having new technology come forward to try it. So I think the phasing we did worked very well. I think secondly, Mike and your councils, <coughs> Gordon and you followed, the notion of requiring a household and income mix, setting out that we were going to have families with children and adults all living in the same community, which was no different from the West End. My first boyfriend lived with his family in the West End, so we had family neighborhoods and we just continued it. With very generous funding, because Ron Basford, the Minister of um, Urban Affairs at the time, happened to be in this riding, so every time we needed some more funding for social housing, Mike would phone up Ron and say, hey Ron, we need a few more units of social housing. And Nathan, the co-ops you were talking about, the nonprofit, came during that era of federal largesse. Looking, one of the things you can do when you used to have a census, was if this is, <laughs> if this is South Falls Creek here, what we tried to do was build a new mix of ages that was roughly similar to the uh, metropolitan area. Came pretty close, certainly different from downtown south and Fairview Slopes where there wasn't that attention to requiring social housing. So we ended up with instead of lifestyle planning, life cycle planning in the downtown. And one of the last things we did, our council of the day did, was say, We've got to have a full range of services. Growth pays its way with the mix of non-family housing, schools, community centers, and requiring the services upfront 
giving a certainty for residents and an environment that they knew they could move into and have the services. And the fifth part of sort of the downtown to me is that a whole range of actors take part in the policy making and the implementation. But what many people are very interested in is the fact that the council is involved in the policy and staff handle in a non-political way the actual processing of applications. That, I think in retrospect, meant that council could put aside the details of the development and move their attention to the next set of policies they wanted to develop. They weren't always looking backwards at what the policies were and uh, trying to then implement them. So we've become a role model, but I would say a role model, for instance, in Melbourne, where I've been doing some work, more jobs in housing rather than just housing communities, and the same in Auckland. They look to us. We've realized that we haven't done everything as well as we could have, and certainly I think a lot of that is the changing funding that's available over the years and the deinstitutionalization, which hasn't been handled well. However, if you want to say what can happen, as you develop this area here with all the new towers, it left the West End without the pressure on those rental units. It's only now that the development's getting um, filled up in here that attention is going on some of these older buildings that are rental, and we wonder how the rental is going to remain in the city. And just a couple of moments comments because everybody's pretty well heard the story of city plan and the issue of what happens if you want to keep some of your industry downtown. And what you do is you move into the neighborhoods where people at the time were saying, Gordon Price was part of this, don't change our neighborhoods. And you actually invite the public to walk in council's shoes for a short while, deal with some of the challenges and <clears throat> involve people in many ways, which I think most importantly engage people in some of the choices and trade-offs that the city was facing with limited funds and limited land. Coming out with city plan where people actually, having worked it through, were prepared to take more housing in neighborhoods, to work with the developers, to come up with neighborhood centers, one of which was built before the policies changed, to agree on amenities, and for a brief moment in 2006, we went from this to community support for a change and choice of housing in neighborhoods. Final four comments, there's no silver bullet. I think what's important to Vancouver is bold leadership, no to freeways, yes, and consistent, yes, for many years as the new neighborhoods developed. Mike, uh, they've taken a little, it's sort of looking closer to the present, isn't it? But that was a while ago. What I think was really important was whether you were left or right as a counselor over those 30 years, you kept the same set of values. And that, I think, helped the cities develop. I would conclude by saying, one of the things I've noticed working elsewhere in the world is we're a very nimble city. We're one of the few cities where the council can decide and there's basically no appeal. Every other city I've been working, there are appeals. The Ontario Municipal Board, um, Australia, New Zealand, it's all about appeals. Here, council could be very nimble. They could make decisions and implement them the next day. I had a question last week in Sweden. How did you do sustainability before sustainability? <laughs> well, <laughs> nice. uh, the answer is, I think, twofold. One, as Rhonda said to me yesterday, we were all children of the 60s. We all read Silent Spring. <laughs> in fact, one of the most evocative books. And if you actually look at Larry and I, Larry would never admit this, <laughs> We actually both had our undergraduate degrees in geography. And in geography, you're taught to think physical, economic, social. 
put them together. So I think underlying, we had a lot of the principles which became sustainability before sustainability. Can you tell us the oh, well, you can tell Ray, well, yeah. our mentor, and Larry, yes. and guess who? Right. Rhonda? Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> Trish French. Nice. <laughs> An architect, but all people who led different parts of the process. We found many things in public engagement worked very well, but we found that in most cases, unless the public got involved in advising on choices, people weren't buying in to changes in their community. And we realize how tr fragile trust is. This is gonna be my next article on how you can move from Knight and Kingsway where everybody said, yes, do it to us, to no, not in my backyard again. As an academic, switching hats for a moment, I think a lot of what we did in Vancouverism was a result not just of nice sideshows, but also some very serious research at different key points in time. Rhonda, your financing growth, and some of the earlier and later work on the downtown, all were things that showed there was some analysis behind the development. I don't think if you're planning Vancouver today, you can necessarily look to lessons from the past. Some yes, but our context completely changed. I think Bill alluded to that a few minutes ago. <laughs> we went from an era of prosperity. We were worried about greening. We weren't worried about climate change to the same extent or the economic uncertainty. It takes time, and I was in Gothenburg last week, and this is a picture from there, where they're kind of saying, what are we going to do with seawater rise? Do we have enough time to do our plans? And that's a question for future planners. So my suggestion is the more you can involve people in the process, the more they understand and hopefully will be there to react as the changes happen to the future. So that's a quick run through Vancouverism for me. <laughs>